As I'm sure many of you will know, this channel started, and always has been, about Formula 1 and taking the piss out of it. In recent years, that's been particularly easy to do. These days, I don't even need to write the jokes anymore as the sport hands me material on a silver plate. People have asked me though, given I slag it off so much, do I actually enjoy it? And of course I do. I've loved it since I was still in the womb. Is it the best single-seater championship motorsport has to offer these days? You see, I don't think so. F1 is known for its engineering battleground. Rafts of highly educated people, way smarter than you or I, finding the fastest way to traverse a racetrack. Hundreds upon thousands of hours, all culminating in... Yeah. While this is special in its own right, the approach does have drawbacks. The cars we get are never designed to race alongside one another, even when we've tried to design the regulations for that very purpose in more recent years. And that's just the tip of the iceberg in regards to problems surrounding the sport. I could go into the costs required for a team to operate, the costs required for a driver to get onto the grid, the costs required to buy a hat with Lance Stroll's name on it. Why you do that, I don't know, but these are all problems that won't go away, be that they're just ingrained into the sport's DNA or that it's run by a capitalist. You get the point. Wouldn't it be nice then to have a separate series, one that still carried some of the world's best single-seater talent, one more focused on the racing and the ability of the drivers, one which didn't cost a kidney to actually go and see? Well, what if I said such a series already exists and we just needed to be brave? and look to America. I've been covering IndyCar properly on the channel for just about a year now, and before that, on and off, when a few too many drivers hit the wall. But what last year taught me is that not enough people are taking the series seriously, and are so caught up in the stigma surrounding it, they're missing out on what I would argue is the best single-seater series on the planet. And yes, that means trumping F1. In case you've never heard of it before, IndyCar marks the top flight level of American single-seater racing. Its first event actually predates F1's inaugural race by almost half a century, taking place back in Portland back in June of 1909. It's had a somewhat complicated history since then, and since I'm too lazy to research all of that myself, I'll just hand over to someone who's done that hard work already. So IndyCar racing is about as old as time itself, if time began in the 1900s. The series began under the name Champ Car, underneath the governing body, the AAA, the American Automobile Association. The first official race of the series was a street race around Portland in 1909, which was a 14 mile long track which is absurd by today's standards. The majority of tracks were paved with dirt except for one that stood out. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway was paved with bricks, making it the fastest track on the calendar due to improved grip. This allowed cars to travel up to 70 mile per hour. Alright, any 17 year old in a Corsa can get that these days, but we're talking about cars with the structural integrity of Devlin DeFrancesco's IndyCar career. In 1911, the AAA had the ingenious idea to make this its own grand event, making it a 500 mile long race and naming it the 1911 International 500 mile sweepstakes race, which was obviously renamed in due course, but it's always been referred to as the 500. The first winner of this fabled event was Ray Haroon in his custom-built Marmon Wasp, being the only car on the grid with a single seat. This saved weight, people noticed this, and thus the single-seater race car was born. The AAA sanctioned IndyCar races until 1956, when USAC inherited the series. The calendar was always pretty confusing. They had paved ovals, dirt ovals, street courses, road courses, and even the Pikes Peak hill climb. This would change in 1965, when Jim Clark won the Indy 500 in a car with a rear fitted engine. This was massive because it allowed the car to travel closer to the ground, making it significantly quicker. Around a dirt track? Not so much. USAC removed all dirt tracks from the calendar in 1970 in order to retain a consistent car build throughout the season. In 1979, the series split into kart and IndyCar due to disagreements with how the series was run, with IndyCar becoming the Indy Racing League in the 1990s. This kick-started a string of unfortunate drama which slashed the popularity of IndyCar racing as a whole, but it's way too much to discuss here. Basically, we don't like this man. Long story short, the two merged back together in 2008, reviving the IndyCar series that we know and love today. Big thank you to Dylan for that. Make sure you check out his channel down in the description below. Now let's get a bit more in depth with the cars themselves. Unlike Formula 1, IndyCar is a spec series. Well, for the most part. Whilst a selection of the internals, like dampers and anti-roll bars, can be manufactured by the teams, and on a race weekend the cars can be set up however the drivers like, any aerodynamic or high-performance parts are identical across the entire grid. The only exception to this is in the engine department, with Honda and Chevrolet the choice here, though again, the performance differential is minimal at this point. Lotus used to be a supplier here too, but in short, their engines were piles of flaming hot shits back in 2012, so they're out of the picture nowadays. IndyCar is often criticised for this spec nature, but I feel those people don't quite understand the point. The sport isn't trying to be this technical war zone similar to the likes of Formula 1, and in keeping their cars as identical as possible, you're left with some fantastic and close racing. 
There's no one out there looking for a loophole that will allow the team to win all but one race that season. By contrast, IndyCar saw seven different winners in 2023, in a year that was deemed a domination by champion Alex Polo anyway. There's a reason why you don't see many IndyCar predictions videos out there on YouTube. Admittedly, part of that reason is that there are so few IndyCar YouTubers out there to begin with, but the other is that with driver skill and track characteristics playing such a bigger role, the sport is so hard to predict in the first place. I say that like any of my F1 picks have come true over the last few years. Anyway, that's the spec nature of the series detailed. Now, what else do people slag the sports off for? Oh yeah, ovals. There's this false assumption that all Americans are able to do is turn left and put their foot down. Admittedly, it's one that I've used as a basis for many of the joke over the years and will likely use again, but IndyCar is so much more than just racing around ovals. The 2024 season will take place across 18 races, comprising of four street circuits, seven purpose-built tracks, and a further seven ovals. And whilst that might still sound like a lot of putting one's foot down and turning left, it's not necessarily that simple. Every oval on the calendar is vastly different in regards to the technical challenges and the way that the cars need to be set up to circulate them quickly. The cars are also equipped with specialist aero kits for these events, meaning we still get to see some fantastic wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing, made all the more exciting given these cars are side-by-side -side at hundreds of miles per hour and centimetres from things going very, very wrong. 2024 in particular sends the sport back to the Milwaukee Mile for two races at the tail end of the season. The nature of the track means it drives more like a road course than your standard oval, posing a new challenge that the drivers haven't faced since the last event there in 2015. Outside of the oval races, the series ventures into some of the most famous tracks America has to offer, including the streets of Long Beach, Road America, and Laguna Seca. Sebring may still be a wet dream for a lot of IndyCar fans, but hey, maybe one day. One of IndyCar's biggest attractors, though, has to be the Indianapolis 500. The month of May is reserved for high-speed racing around the world's most famous oval complex. You can expect high-octane racing from start to finish, and given it takes place on the same day as the Monaco Grand Prix, you'll probably be in some need of that. Just watch my video on it from last year to know exactly what I mean. So we've spoken about the cars, and now the tracks. That leaves us with the teams and the drivers. Unlike Formula 1, IndyCar decided it actually wanted to have SLE season last year, so quite a lot has changed. Rather than go into everyone here, I'm just going to pick out a few specific names that you might want to keep your eye on in 2024. Reigning champion Alex Pillow has stayed with Chip Ganassi Racing, despite signing a contract with McLaren for the 2024 campaign. We'll have to wait and see which higher-ups he chooses to piss off this season. The Spaniard will have new DHL backing this time round, the company switching from Andretti after Grosjean delivered his car into the wall a few too many times in 2023. Below lines up alongside six-time champion Scott Dixon and the Chip Ganassi outfit, which also retains Marcus Armstrong and brings in rookies Linus Lundqvist and Kiffin Simpson for 2024. Their ongoing scrap with Team Penske is expected to continue this season, who keep their 2023 lineup of Chief Angry Man Will Power alongside Scott McLaughlin and 2023 Indy 5 100 winner Joseph Newgarden. The Andretti team will also look to bounce back after an uncharacteristically underwhelming season last year. Roman Grosjean has been jettisoned in a ball of flame and replaced with XF1 and Chip Ganassi racer Marcus Ericsson. The Swede will line up alongside Carl Kirkwood and Colton Herter, with all three drivers aiming to impress for a chance to contend for Andretti's F1 lineup when the sport eventually decides to stop being assholes and let them in. I've mentioned Grosjean a few times, and while many expected him to fall off the grid for this year, he's found a lifeline at Junkos Hollinger Racing. The Argentinian outfit fielded Britain Callum Eilat in 2023, and while he impressed, international relations saw him drop for the Phoenix in 2024. Roman will be looking to return to form after a highly disappointing campaign with Andretti, so will be one to watch for sure. Let's also touch on McLaren, who would have fielded Pato Award, Alexander Rossi and David Malukas in 2024. I said would as David pulled a Lance Stroll and picked a fight with his bicycle before the new season. That will see the Americans sit out of at least the opening round of the championship, and at the time of recording, his replacement is currently unknown. I know who I'd sign up though. Finally, no FP1 IndyCar video would be complete without a mention of Stingray Rob. Now driving for AJ Foyt in 2024, whether he can win races and take the championship by storm or not, he'll win the award for best name in all of motorsports anyway. I've only really scratched the surface here, but I hope this video has reached out to at least a few people who might now give IndyCar a chance in the new season. The opening race takes place on the 10th of March in St. Petersburg. 
And no, that's not the Russian one. I feel I have to make that clarification every year at this point. Viewers in the UK can watch all the action on Sky Sports F1. And unlike you Americans, we don't have to sit through adverts every 10 laps. We do have to sit through Tom Gamel's commentary instead, though. Let me know what storylines you're excited for down in the comment section below. And if you're new here, I'll be covering every race of the 2024 IndyCar season right here on the channel. So make sure you get subscribed so you don't miss any of that. A final thank you, of course, goes to my patrons and channel members for supporting me in the channel. And you can get involved with that by heading down to the links in the description below. I'll be back very soon with another video, but until then, have a good one.